Morning guys, how are we doing today? Uh, it's a Monday morning. Did my gigs in the cities last weekend. Uh, I'm not gonna dive into this too deep, but this is from Miles Davis Live Evil. And there's this conception or perception perhaps that this is all that fusion is. And I can't think of a worse guitar tone than John McLaughlin. It's fingernails on a chalkboard. It's, if Jackie McLean is sharp, it's just such an acidic tone. <clears throat> I get he's a great player, but I like rich, full tones, not this fingernails on a chalkboard. It's just so agitated. And he's so loud in the mix. It's like, oh, I, I don't understand how people love this. And I'm sure if you're a guitar player, they always oh, virtuoso, but it's beyond my ears. And it just hurts. That's all I can really say about it. It just hurts. It's not fun. There's zero melodic structure zero harmonic feel it's just noise loud obtrusive cacophonic noise and the band itself at times has some great little grooves and patterns going and there's miles now and the miles tone is actually a little too mclaughlin like here for me it's it's hard for me to get why people praise this era of Miles Davis so much. And it's not to say there's not incredible musicians in the band, because there obviously is. You know, the whole foundation of 70s and 80s jazz exists through these Miles groups at this point. From Chick Corea to Herbie Hancock to Wayne Shorter. It's just a huge list. Dave Hall and player after player, Al Demiola. It's just, you know what I mean? It's a who's who of a lot of the great players. I, I air toes on a lot of these directors. Uh, but McLaughlin, I was trying to listen to that Birds of Fire record. Unlistenable to me. It's awful. And all your ability in the world can't make up for your awful choice of guitar tone. And maybe you want that tone so you can be out in front of the mix and cutting through everything else. But that seems kind of egotistical to me as well. And I'm a guitar tone guy. I need tone resonance. Uh, just I need that shape nice round full sound I don't want this jagged edged little throwing star of sonic inconvenience and Fillmore West live with the Fillmore uh, there's a number of miles live records from this period and I just find a lot of it so dissonant and I just struggle with it, especially when you could be listening to this. It's clean. It's not all fuzzy and static. Everything seems to be in tune and harmonious interaction with each other. And I would, I'll just guarantee it. I could play this song for 100 people and 99 out of 100 would pick this over what I was just playing. And so I often think ego. People think that they get it. It's not fun. It's so... Donald Bird. Bird lays it down in the 70s. One of many, but Donald Bird's fusion stuff has a lot more R&B edge to it. And... R&B is as much, I mean, sorry, fusion is as much fused with R&B as it is with rock. And there's a school of thinkers out there that think fusion is only jazz that's fused with rock. No, it's not. It's also fused with rhythm and blues. And it's that stuff that the black community actually got back into and danced to and enjoyed. George Benson, Grover Washington, people can get down to that. Roy Ayers. It's this persistence of Miles Davis. A lot of it's 
counterintuitive. A lot of it just seems... Why? Help me out. Why do you enjoy this if you do? Because it's beyond me. This is painful. That's gotta be the most sour. Ugh. It's like squeezing a lemon in your mouth. It's, again, it comes down to enjoyment. And you shouldn't have to sit there squinting, suffering, to, to, to feel like, oh, this was worthwhile. It's such an insane, unnecessary part of the equation. So my wife just came down the stairs and she was just like, what are you listening to? And that's more honest to me and the people going, this is brilliant. And it's not to say there's not moments and passages that I love, but for the most part, McLaughlin's a deal breaker for me. Can't, can't do it. It's, and again, one could listen to this, but why would you? Warm, it's funky. There's this barrage of Miles LPs from the 70s that are double live albums. And it's. I don't even want to say it's an acquired taste. It's something you've just chosen to like and you feel you have to have it because it's Miles. Because I think that's what I did. That's why I bought all of them. And I can't listen to them anymore, you know? I went through a few of them the other day just looking for something. I might be able to play at a gig sometime. It's so not accessible. It's so not melodic. It's so not fun. <clears throat> I think it would make half the bar squint to be like... And you don't ever want people saying, can you turn the DJ down? He's too loud. You play this, people will be like, I love this. What is this? Donald Burr. It's a great place to start with Don Burr's 70s materials, his greatest hits, Don Burr's best, whatever. Uh, all the stuff that's recorded by the Maxwell Brothers. It's just wonderful production. Uh, kind of proto-disco funk, you know, and Blackbird, Flight Time, Stepping Into Tomorrow, uh, Street Lady, Lynn Anson's Princess, Sky High, Change Makes You Wanna Hustle. These are just great tracks from uh, Stepping Into Tomorrow. It's, it's one of those records from that period are just outstanding. Uh, and there's still some great playing by Bird on them. And I'll take Bird's tone at this point over Miles Davis any day. And again, a lot of it just comes down to I feel like Miles is pissed off. And I think that anger manifests itself in I kind of an F you sound. You know? I just think he's bitter. He's just so... It's impossible to stay cool, first of all. It's impossible to stay on the cutting edge. You know, film, music, food, restaurants, you name it, fashion. Music's no exception. You can be cutting edge and be innovative and lead the pack for a brief moment, but your label, your sound, your <clears throat> accents, whatever you do that makes you different will become weary eventually and over copied and It'll end up being the thing that dates you. I was listening to some 90s, late 90s, early 2000s R&B the other day. And there's things in that now that's so dated and sounds like it's such a part of that era. Those sounds they were using, the new the tricks and toys that were coming out in the music business. That stuff sounds like the time it came out in. And that's why when you have an Adele who's just using pianos and little bass and drums and just real basic standard instrumentation, none of the gimmicks that are new and trendy and hot. When you just play kind of a trad sound, that trad sound will always sound more modern in a way because it never ever sounds dated. <clears throat> New Jack Swing sounds dated. And Miles really struggles, I think, with wanting to be hip, wanting to be 
seen as the edges, you know, I mean, the cutting edge. And he rarely really was. You know, the first of the cool is really Jerry Mulligan, Gil Evans. Uh, there's a lot of cats that are part of that. Miles is just a part of that. And it gets released under Miles Davis' name in like 1962 by Capitol. But before that, it was never really a Miles Davis thing. Miles had become a big popular name. Because those sessions are from 49, 50, early. I think some's even from 48. And that little tentet, that little group of musicians that were hanging out, they were doing this all kind of together. And Miles was as anonymous a name as was in that bunch at that point. And Mulligan was always kind of upset that Capital ended up kind of crediting it to Miles Davis versus the cool. So to give him credit or <clears throat> some kind of leadership of the session and make him seem like he was the one driving that sound is really an insult to everyone else involved. Yet Miles gets that credit a lot. Miles was on the heels of bebop and never really was a bebop player. Miles never really was a great hard bop player. He's not great at tempo. He's not great at aggression. He's, he's better at anger. He's better at bitterness. Resent, resentment. Uh, he'd rather play kind of slow, minimally, and filled with tension. A very different kind than you get from a Sonny Clark and a Lee Morgan. It's a very different expression of my place in the world. Coming from middle class, Miles doesn't have quite the same experience and struggle, but he has every much the bitterness and resentment because he wasn't really accepted in the black community or the white community the same way a guy who came from the streets was. Uh, so you always hear that in Miles playing, that kind of fuck the world. And it wasn't until I started to, to, to factor in people's personalities into their playing, like I talked about in that John Coltrane Blue Train episode a couple of last week. When you factor in environment and experience and then personality, how can Miles be that little person that he is with his attitude and not be speaking that through his horn? He has to be. Just like Coltrane has to be speaking his spirituality that's who he was. <clears throat> so, you see all these things attributed to Miles, being one of the great band leaders. Miles poached people. Art Blakey was a great band leader. Uh, Count Basie, uh, Benny Goodman, uh, Lionel Hampton, those are great band leaders. Uh, these guys picked people from schools, from local bars, from unestablished places and brought him into their groups. Blakey could found guys everywhere. Miles would pick him from already established jazz groups, you know, and he wasn't picking an anonymous unknowns. You know, so he's kind of cherry picking the best talent because he can pay the most because he's on Columbia. And so again, the idea that he was a great band leader, I think half the people who played with him couldn't stand him. You know, that, that seems, Short of Charles Mingus, he seems like the one guy a lot of people left his group and were like, I can't play with him. And <clears throat> it's a job you take because the money's going to be good. And so the idea that he was a great band leader is a little bit uh, overinflated by today's perspectives. The idea that he invents fusion, it's ridiculous. There's all kinds of that stuff, that crossover happening in the late 60s. You know, even the second great quintet. That was Miles finally succumbing to the pressures of what was cutting edge in jazz that he kind of resisted for a few years. He didn't like Eric Dolphy when he first heard it. He didn't like Ornette Coleman, the early era of that dissonant sound. And by the time 64, 65 rolls around, he's recruiting Hancock and Shorter and Williams and Carter to make that kind of music on Columbia for the masses to hear. And again, he gets all the credit. It's really one of the most unfair manifestations of the modern perspectives of jazz back in the day. Uh, I didn't really even mean to go on this tirade, but uh, listening to the Donald Byrd and then comparing it to the Miles Davis, it's like, <clears throat> how would anybody who's being honest say they'd rather hear this? Nice bass player right there. Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, it's it's okay to like it. If you love it, you love it. That's great. <clears throat> I think a lot of posturing goes on with jazz listeners. I think they feel like they're supposed to like it. I think in order to feel hip from when you read all the jazz publications and the reviewers and the writers, it's like you're cool if you get bitches brew. So you gotta pretend like you love it. You gotta pretend like, oh yeah, I'm I'm one of those guys. I get it. And I could say this because it was me. They got me. I felt obligated to say, yeah, this is brilliant. When in hindsight, it's it's something you can choose to like, but don't be surprised if your wife's like, please turn that off. You know, I think wives are far more honest about our music than we are sometimes. You know, what does she say when you play that? It'll give you some insight to what you have to deal with as a DJ. You know, that self-indulgent, I'm gonna play the wildest shit, it just doesn't work that way. And so I didn't, like I said, I didn't really even mean to go this route, but listening to the bird and thinking about the McLaughlin, I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, I wanna move on to something different right now. Hold on a sec. So again, what is fusion? It's an important thing to define and there's no two definitions of it that are the same. And in in a nutshell, it is the fusion of jazz with rock, rhythm and blues, and taking the elements of all that stuff and crossing it over. And for my ears, for my tastes, the stuff that sounds more like art rock, prog rock, that crossover jazz fusion, I can't stand it. I can't even pretend to say I like it anymore. It's it's so overinflated, so ego driven. Listen to me. Listen to all these crazy chord changes that don't make any sense. You know, let's play these overly dynamic sounds on top of this. It's, it's, I don't get it. You know, and to me, the stuff that's R&B fusion with jazz, a lot of the rock fusion guys are like, oh, that's not even fusion. You're wrong. It is. 100% it is. And that's actually where the audience goes. The, The audience of jazz. It's rhythm and blues that comes along with guys like Louis Jordan that changed the course of not just what the black listener listened to, but the white listeners as well. The audience for jazz morphs into rhythm and blues and early rock and roll, which is essentially just rhythm and blues as well. There's not very much that's different between early rock and roll and early rhythm and blues. It's, It's pretty much the same thing. On some levels, you could say the white cats doing R&B, Ricard rock and roll, but that's not even that clear because there's a lot of black rock and roll kind of guys from that era too that we listen to like that's just R&B. And by the time the '60s rolls along, rock and roll is changing and sounding, uh, focusing more on the blues aspect at times. Sometimes focusing more on composition. So rock definitely moves away from the groove and pattern of of rhythm and blues. And when rock goes that way, it becomes kind of a separate thing. But we forget rock was very entrenched in our R&B and jazz. And so those aspects of jazz that went that other direction on that little branch that few people really cared about or bought, it can't be a representation of the entire history of jazz. And there's a lot of people I see in these Facebook groups that their entire knowledge of jazz is 65 to 1982. And they're experts and they wanna criticize everything else and be so influential with what they say. And yet you don't have half of the body of work or or the canon to really speak about the jazz that sold, that mattered. If you write books that no one reads, you're not that great an author. And you have to sometimes take into account the stuff that people are reading and recognize that that's the canon. And so again, I kind of want to move on from that, but fusion has different aspects to it. And don't let the jazz audiophile snobs 
condescend Donald Byrd to you ever. Grover Washington, ever. Go let him. Bobby Humphrey, if you're digging that Bobby Humphrey, enjoy that shit because it's good. And you can play it at a party and even though no one knows it, they're going to be like, okay, this is dope. What is this? That's important. Music is meant to connect. It's meant to connect. So again, Miles, we give him too much credit. And he does do certain things really well. And his most important aspect is the limelight he puts on jazz just because of the success he has at Columbia. And you could say that same thing for Dave Brubeck to a degree. You know, Brubeck sold a lot of records in the 50s and 60s on Columbia. And so a lot of people have Brubeck in their collection and no other jazz. There's people who have Sketches of Spain, Time Out, and no other jazz. You know, so, and if you have Sketches of Spain and, and Time Out as the only two jazz records, your perspective of jazz is going to be very limited and what you think jazz is, and yet because Sketches of Spain sounds like it does, your definition of what jazz is is also going to be incredibly wide because that's such a fusion of jazz and, and European tradition. So it's, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. Uh, we're going to move on. I want to talk to you about a great little label out of New York called Urania. And I don't have the entire body of work, but I do have most of the main pieces. And uh, this is Accent on Tenor Sax, Coleman Hawkins. And again, it's a label that will have multiple covers for some of these records, which can make it tricky. But this is number 1201, the first Urania LP. Don't think there's any 10 inches here. Uh, does it list the group? Ernie Royals on the trumpet, fantastic player. Eddie Burt, who, of course, on trombone was winning Player of the Year stuff at Savoy. Earl Knights on the piano, Wendell Marshall on the bass, O.C. Johnson, and Sidney Gross plays the guitar. So it's a great little lineup. And of course, if you're in New York, you just have access to all these greats. And this is some Coleman recorded in that time frame. And you get to really hear a fairly hungry, uh, fairly driven Coleman Hawkins. Most of his other recordings from the 50s are gonna be Moodsville, Swingsville stuff on Prestige, uh, Riverside, or some stuff on Capitol and RCA that's gonna have a kind of a watered down, play it clean for the white folks, Coleman. And this is Coleman blowing it, blowing it. And you can hear <clears throat> Dexter Gordon, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Wayne Shorter, all those elements, he is the antecedent of all of it. He's, he's the predecessor of all those great tenor players, and he defines what this instrument can now be and now do. And that's so much a part of his legacy. Number 1202 is Accent on Dixieland with Pee Wee Irwin. And uh, another great Dixieland player who kind of gets overlooked nowadays. Fairly anonymous band here, which a lot of the Dixieland players have become fairly anonymous to us. There was a real revival in the 60s, early, mid 50s with the Dixieland sound. In part because the directions of bebop had taken jazz. Sometimes when a music goes off the rails, people look back to what was popular 10, 15, 20 years ago and kind of relive that. We see it with disco, we saw it with the 90s, we see it with the 80s. Music kind of has this kind of recyclable nature. And there was a big revival. Riverside, Blue Note, a lot of these places we're putting out uh, Wilbur to Paris on Atlantic, Sydney Bechet has late records on a lot of different little labels. Uh, a lot of it had a real value and was actually somewhat commercially viable. I would guess some of that Dixieland stuff was selling better than a lot of the bebop, hardbop stuff was. But uh, again, Pee Wee Irwin, great little player, 1202. Number 1203 was the aforementioned Ernie Royal. This is a tough record to find. Beautiful album cover, sitting there with his trumpet. If I recall, he plays with Basie, and he might have a brother as well. If I, remember, I think he does. Uh, beautiful label. These records are pretty tough to come by. There's that beautiful Urania logo. <clears throat> Wonderful player with a nice warm center, uh, melodic thrusting pulse. He's, you know, he's not gonna try to blow the doors off, but he's got 
a real dexterous sound. Jimmy Hamilton, I talked to him a few weeks ago. Uh, this is one of the great clarinet players, plays with Ellington for a long time. He makes two records at Urania, which I talked about recently. I just found these two. These are hard to come by, man. Great album cover. This is number 1204. So I have the first one, two, three, four of the label. 1205 is uh, Jack Teagarden, more New Orleans sound. And of course, Teagarden works with Armstrong off and on for years. <clears throat> so Urania has a pretty wide focus. Uh, the great Ruby Braff is on trumpet on this. Milt Hinton's on, on the bass. Lucky Thompson plays tenor. Uh, Sidney Gross shows up on guitar. Kenny Kersey on piano when Denzel Best is on the drums. This is another <clears throat> uh, iteration of the Urania logo. Nice stuff. Number 1205. And again, some of these have multiple covers. So you gotta be careful. Number 1206. This is a tough record to find. This is Lucky Thompson. Accent on tenor. And what a beautiful cover. You can see Lucky there in the horn of his own trump uh, tr saxophone. Got the little loaded dice there. Uh, accent on tenny, tenor. Lucky Thompson. You know, you got the little roll of the dice. And again, it's got that great Urania label. I think there's some great players on this too. If I remember Coleman, I, no. Billy Taylor's on the piano. Jimmy Hamilton's on clarinet. Elsie Johnson, Oscar Pettiford, and Sidney Gross. So a great lineup. Really a tough record to come by. And this record you can get into the hundreds of dollars pretty easily. Uh, I'm missing 1207. If I remember, it's kind of a old swing band kind of thing. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember what it is right now, but 1208 is the other Jimmy Hamilton record I was just talking about. Uh, again, just a fantastic player. And this one has a bigger band on it, if I remember. Yeah, it's got a lot of players. Ernie Royal, Lucky Thompson, Earl Knight, Sidney Cross, Oscar Pettiford. Uh, just a pretty wide range of guys. But again, this is very modern stuff from these guys. They're not playing swing era stuff. Royal, Hamilton, these guys are doing real modern stuff. Real contemporary with what's happening. 1209, Mood and Blue. Fantastic album cover. One of the probably most sought after Urania records. Uh, Coleman Hawkins, Ernie Royal, Louis the Lion Smith, Jack Teagard, and Lucky Thompson. Outstanding stuff. And you don't see Will Lyon Smith in combos very often. He's one of those kind of New York Harlem stride piano guys that most of his stuff's kind of just him unaccompanied or battling another piano or maybe maybe a bass player. So to see him singing him with a combo is pretty interesting. Uh, Will Lyon Smith, I think, has a record on Urania as well. That might be what that 1207 was. I can't recall. But uh, great stuff. Great cover, great group, great label. Uh, number 1211, so I'm missing 1210, is uh, Dance, Dance, Dance. It's got Don Redmond's orchestra with Al Hall, Coleman Hawkins, Hank Jones, Joe Jones, the great Joe Wilder's on this, Harry Edison's, George Juvivier, Al Keola. So a pretty serious band for Don Redmond doing this swing stuff. Again, a great album cover. And you got the stereo logo right there. Again, fairly tough to come by. Well, that was probably not as tough as some. Uh, this is the Fletcher Henderson and his All Stars Urania Monophonic. Exciting jazz favorites, 1212. And you always gotta love any album cover that features the most beautiful thing in the world. And I'm not gonna apologize for saying that I think it's a beautiful thing. Fantastic stuff. Uh, he's playing with a really all-star lineup there. I talked about this record in a recent episode as well. <clears throat> you got Rex Stewart, Taft Jordan, Emmett Berry, Al Casey, Benny Morton, J.C. Higginbottom, Dickie Wells, Jimmy Crawford. It's just like a who's who. Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins. Serious, serious. And there's some real swing on that record. And this is jazz at Stereoville. I think this one might be a compilation memory serves but it might not be it's got Coleman Hawkins Bud Freeman Rex Stewart Cootie Williams uh, JC Higginbottom Lawrence Brown Hank Jones Billy Bauer Milt Hinton and Gus Johnson that's just incredible uh, Billy Bauer's a great guitar player Gus Johnson fantastic drummer 
You got Lawrence Brown from a lot of Ellington alumni in that. <clears throat> Fantastic stuff. And the last one I got here is actually from a different Urania sequence. This is number 1005, and it's Milt Shawn's orchestra. And this is more of an easy listening uh, release on, the, on a different sequence. It's not part of the 1200 sequence. Uh, it's got a great cover, though, and I found it for a good price. So I grabbed it. And again, it is, it is more easy listening. And I think it's also one of the only white records here. And most of these guys are black hats. Uh, Jack Teagard is white. But for the most part, this is a different sounding Urania and not as essential as everything else I've shown you. So I said, well, I think one of the things I'm missing is a William Line Smith. And then I think there's one other Urania that I haven't found. Pause it real quick and I'll see if I can find it. So yeah, my memory was correct. It was a William Line Smith record at 1207. 1210 is a Henry Brandon. Uh, it looks like a big swing thing. It looks like it's a white big band, which I don't know nothing about. I don't have that. And then after 12, 12, 12, there's three records that come out by uh, <clears throat> the Dorsey Brothers. And it's probably stuff from back in the day that they're reissuing. So the label seems to kind of, I don't want to say lose its way, but they were probably losing money and they needed something that was going to be a little more commercially viable. And the Dorseys had a huge appeal in America. And how successful those records were, I don't know. I don't have them yet. But I do see them from time to time. So I do feel like they're a little bit more commonplace and easier to come by. What we were just listening to, though. Listen to that. <clears throat> See, that's why we love jazz. That's what it's... That's how it feels, man. I just don't understand a lot of these jazz collectors. I don't understand what they think they're hearing. That? The tone? The breathiness of it? It's just gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. So, here we are. It's, like I said, a Monday. And the DJ stuff's going great. We had a really full house on Saturday. Did a pretty good job on Sunday as well in the other establishment. It's fun to be back to work. You know, it really is. Uh, please check out my merchandise store. There's lots of cool gear there, as well as some fantastic stuff for the new podcast logo. Check that out, Shepherd Speak. The podcast is out there for those who want to walk around listening to what I say. Uh, it's available to you. Actually, there is merchandise now that relates to that. There's lots of stuff in there, including some great jazz Shepherd coffee mugs, which I'll show you. This is uh, the coffee mugs for the coffee shop that's in the process of being done. And these are available on the merch store. They're a little expensive, but that's just the nature of this store app that I'm using. They help us make the coffee shop happen. So you're not just getting a coffee shop coffee mug, you're helping us make it. Uh, there's also some great new hoodies and great new t-shirts as well. So check out the merch store, all you Patreon supporters. Thanks very much again, I appreciate you guys. Uh, I haven't made any Patreon content for months, but pretty much everyone has told me I make enough content here on the YouTube channel, and that's what most people are paying me for, is for the YouTube material. So again, I'll just give you a shout out now. Much love for all you cats, much appreciated. Uh, thanks for checking out the channel. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Put a like the thumbs up, all the other stuff that you're supposed to do. I'm not great at that part of this, I'm not. It's not my strong suit. So anyway, appreciate you all. Y'all be safe. Have a good Monday or whatever day you happen to watch this on. We'll talk to you all soon. Peace.